part one of this two-part series points out that most bugs cannot survive in the suburban habitat they face. Gone are the nutritious weeds they evolved to thrive on, replaced by sterile lawns and showy but nectarless cultivars with bitter toxic foliage. Yeah, so, lots of people would say, it's a good thing, right? Yeah, many of us had rather those pests stayed in some kind of parallel universe and spared us the trouble of using pesticides. But believing that the planet can be bent to our convenience is a cockeyed view of reality. Not only is it an incorrect notion, it's harmful to us in the long run, because our inflated sense of our own importance can keep us from realizing that life on this planet could do very well without humans. Thank you very much. What's essential are those pesky bugs. Without them, most life would die out. They're the bedrock of every ecosystem, and destroying them amounts to sawing off the limb we're sitting on. The May 2020 issue of National Geographic pointed out that there was a 76% drop in insect numbers between 1989 and 2016. The headline of the article was, You'll miss them when they're gone. Indeed. The situation could get so dire that we would yearn not only for the flash of lightning bugs, the thrum of cicadas, and the flutter of a butterfly, but perhaps even for the buzz of houseflies, which are, after all, pollinators. And while it's true that mosquitoes provide a big chunk of the diet of quite a few birds, we see them as tiny enemies. And it's hard to imagine a day when we'd think twice about swatting one of them. But the time could come we'd be grateful to see even one of them. Now, the smart move for our species would be for farmers to switch to organic farming only, and for the rest of us to create bug-friendly habitat in our yards with native plants. Putting in natives is what my husband started doing in 2013 after reading Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home. Tallamy argues that bugs need native plants to thrive, and we need bugs to survive. If you see the logic of that, and you're looking for ideas about which native plants you might put in, I'll provide some resources for finding out which plants will work in your region. But first, let me give you an inkling of what's involved in going native. We live in St. Louis, so some of our choices might not work where you are, but plenty of the plants I'll show you will work almost anywhere. Milkweed, for example. It's the only plant where monarch butterflies will lay their eggs, and the monarch populations have plummeted by more than 80% in recent decades. Why not give them a boost by putting in one of the many varieties of this flower? Another of the tall, sun-loving plants is the ox sunflower. Ours grows near a path, and because it gets tall and leggy, it has to be propped up. The ox typifies what people often dislike in native plants. They're messy. They topple and trail. Instead of looking planted and planned, they look like colorful weeds. But if a gardener plants these weeds in tiers, they look more like what we call a garden. In front of the six or seven foot tall Joe Pye weed, which blooms in August, you could put shining blue stars. They bloom in May. And below them, slender mountain mint, whose white flowers will be covered with pollinators in July. There, see? Natives don't have to look like a weed patch. This is a respectable flower bed in a suburban garden. Near the house, my husband Connie, who is the gardener in the family, wanted short plants that won't block the view. And the bed he put there would be appropriate for the more formal look of a front yard. The bees and butterflies are all over his rose verbena, which blooms most of the season. Magenta poppy mallow mingles with the verbena, and the two of them duke it out for position. To give their pinks and purples some pop, Connie planted lanceleaf coreopsis behind them. One more low-lying plant I'd like to plug is mist ageratum. Avoid the cultivars of this flower, 
It's the native species that the bugs love. Of the three low-lying species, only the ageratum blooms grow in tight clusters. People long for flower beds as tightly packed as a colorful bullseye. So nature's slovenly habit of strewing her creations in sprawling disarray offends our by-the-numbers sense of order. But the main reason we want our cultivars is that we're accustomed to big, showy, in-your-face blooms. If most native plants are delicate minuets, those sassy, grassy cultivars are rock and roll. Look, if nature wants to give you rock and roll, she'll stir up a thunderstorm. And you better just hope she doesn't give you Wagner in the form of hurricanes and tornadoes. Best to content yourself most of the time with the chamber music and Brahms lullabies that nature puts up on her channel. Those small, delicate blooms will reward you if you take time to examine them. And if you like packed beds of flowers, here's an idea. Especially if you have a large space to fill, skip the annuals and put in coneflowers and black-eyed Susans. Each one sets off the other. But again, work with nature. People want tidy gardens. And once those lovely blooms turn brown, some of us will be tempted to deadhead them. Try to restrain yourself, though, because at that point, those flowers have only done half their seasonal duties. Yes, they fed caterpillars and pollinators. Now they're waiting for the birds to harvest their seeds. And you don't want to miss that. Seeing goldfinches twist and dangle to get at the coneflower seeds and squabble over who owns the flower patch? That's entertainment. Instead of sweating and clipping, you could be chilling on the patio. And if near your patio or deck you plant flowers that appeal to hummingbirds, you double your chances of watching wildlife drama from your lawn chair. Royal catchfly, coral honeysuckle, cardinal flowers, bee balm, beard tongue, and rose turtle head, among others, will attract them. So, you've spared yourself deadheading, watering, applying chemicals, and as the growing season ends, you lazy gardener you, just continue being lazy. Instead of cutting back dead plants for the winter, leave at least 18 inches to 2 feet standing, because that dead vegetation is hosting insect larvae. When you cut it down, you're burying much of the next generation alive. Same goes for dead leaves. Many of them are hosting butterfly larvae. If you're disappointed at not seeing more butterflies in the spring, could be that your tidy gardening habits are part of the reason. So could you maybe rake the leaves on your grass into a compost pile or into flower beds? Once you've had three 55 degree days in a row, you can get rid of that debris. The larvae will have flitted away by then. When you're picking out native plants, consider another important benefit besides their blooms berries. The flowers of those burying plants will feed pollinators and once they've done their job, the berries will feed birds. This gray dogwood planted itself in our yard three or four years ago. Courtesy of some poop from a passing robin would be my guess. And the next generation of robins is glad the last generation pooped where it did. Service berry trees are a favorite of ours because they're a favorite among the birds. So much so that this mockingbird doesn't necessarily wait for the berries to ripen. On Ptolemy's recommendation, Connie planted a pagoda dogwood. It's only four years old now, but it's already muscling to find space for itself beneath two redbuds and a service berry. The lowest branch of that right-hand redbud's probably going to have to go because that tree is a cultivar. The pagoda dogwood deserves priority so that it can spread its arms and offer its berries. Burying shrubs are another worthwhile addition. We have beauty berries, choke berries, and elderberries. Of those three, only elderberries will tolerate some shade. For a really shady spot, we just put in three spice bushes, the shrub where spice bush swallowtail butterflies lay their eggs. Here's one of their young caterpillars spinning some silk on a leaf so that it can anchor itself to the bush. And two weeks later, 
Here's one all grown up, probably even the same one. Finding him was like meeting a celebrity. I had seen pictures of them, but they weren't real until I saw one in the flesh. So plant some spice bushes and you can gawk at your own celebrities. Our winter berries are cultivars that predate Connie's awareness of the whole native-non-native question. But we'll keep them because the birds denude them and the non-native hollies every winter. And Connie has recently planted their native cousin, Possum Hall. I love that name. Take care to get both sexes if you want berries from this plant, because the males pollinate the females. Now, our Midwestern garden is mostly sunny, but what if yours is a shady New England garden? The National Wildlife Federation website can help you find out which wildflowers are most appropriate for where you live and for your circumstances. More about that in a minute. But first let me say that the website advises people as to which plants will attract the most bugs. And their top choice, pretty much wherever you live, is goldenrod. One of the nice things about goldenrod is that it comes in every height, so it'll fit almost any niche. Some want shade, some want sun. When it blooms in fall, combine it with native asters. The yellow in the center of their pink or lavender petals will echo the goldenrod. But one warning, watch out for tall goldenrod. If you don't pull it up after it flowers, it'll multiply like the broomsticks in Fantasia. For springtime, the most highly recommended plant, both by the National Wildlife Federation and by Doug Tallamy, is the prairie willow. Unlike the non-native weeping willows, it prefers dry ground. It's more of a shrub than a tree, so a row of them makes a good hedge. And here's the kicker. In early spring, when pollinators are having the most trouble finding food, the prairie willow is abuzz with life. We don't have any of these yet, but we will. Now, I suggested quite a few plants here, and more are mentioned in part one of this series. But if you want more ideas about what to put in, two sources will be valuable. The first one, the National Wildlife Federation website, recommends the native plants in your zip code that are best at attracting bugs. Google National Wildlife Federation Native Plant Finder and choose Find Native Plants. You can type in your zip code and explore. You'll find an even more comprehensive resource at the end of Bringing Nature Home. Appendix 1 divides the country into six ecological regions and groups plants for each region into ten subdivisions, with plenty of choices listed in each category. Once you have an idea of what you want, the next step would be to Google native plant nurseries or native plant garden centers in your area. But your best resource would be Wild Ones, a national organization whose motto is healing the earth one yard at a time. If you're lucky enough to have a chapter in your area, check with them by all means. Not only will you get ideas about what to plant, You'll find a community of native plant gardeners with a lot of valuable experience. They might warn you, for example, about those invasive tall goldenrods and point out that showy goldenrod knows how to behave itself. Special thanks go to Corey Westcott for her help in editing this film. In the process, Corey, who's a volunteer of the St. Louis Audubon Society's Bring Conservation Home program, shared her expertise with me. I'm a newbie to this topic, and her knowledge was invaluable. 